it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Soft Blows the Breeze from Hell by Arthur Leo Zagat Part 1. Messenger of Horror It was ball-shaped and about the size of a five-year-old's fist. Its color was the yellow-tainted white of a corpse dead a day. It was so weightless that although the lightest of breezes breathed down Stalton's elm-lined blossom streets, it flared before the zephyr, curiously swift, curiously without sound. In the dusk's dim grey hush, the thing was at first noticed by no one, so that for minutes no one thought its presence strange, though the hamlet lay in the midst of rolling fields and the nearest spot sunless and dank enough for the fungus to grow was Roger's Wood, a full five miles away. It darted along the narrow, sod-bordered walk, leaping the grass roots between the worn flagstones, flitting beneath the feet of the strollers in the dreamy twilight. None had any hint of how soon all laughter would be stifled in Stalton, of how soon eyes now sparkling with gaiety would be dark and brooding with dread. It was Hilda Mead who first saw the round thing as it scudded past her along a picket fence pale in the evening's greyness. Look, she exclaimed, snatching her slim hand from Hal Curtin's warm clasp to point at it. Look, darling, what is that? What? her stalwart lover asked, his gaze reluctant to drag itself from her olive elfin face, from the sweet promise of her velvet lips. What is it, dear? That? Oh, I don't like it, Hal. A tiny shudder went through her small boned, round little body. I don't like the way it's running along as though it were alive with a queer kind of life, and well, who knows where it's going? <laughs> Silly, the young man exclaimed, his teeth flashing in a fond smile as he peered after that thing that Hilda had pointed at. Oh, that's nothing but a puffball. It's a common fungus and... Well, I still don't like it, the girl interrupted, pouting prettily at Curtin. I'm afraid of it. Afraid? Instinctively wise in the ways of love, Hell Curtin had sense enough not to laugh, had sense enough to draw Hilda within the strong curve of his arm, to hold her close against his body's slender strength and say, deep voiced. You need never be afraid of anything while I'm alive to protect you. The puffball veered sharply from its course, almost as if possessed of the weird sentience Hilda had ascribed to it. It leaped at a dim seen gate, struck a paling and vanished in the spurt of spore smoke that gives its kind their name. In the next moment, the cottage beyond that gate seemed blotted out by a dark pall. Its outlines merged with the night the yellow rectangles of its windows gone. Something's happened to the lights, Hal Curtin thought. In the blackened house, someone laughed. The laugh was edged with shrillness and utterly humorless, and threaded by a mad sort of agony. More appalling than any scream, it held Blossom Street in thrall to a sudden icy paralysis, so that there was no movement under the elms but only blanching faces and the gasp of core breath. Then there was light again in those windows, a burst of lurid light that lay in whirling sheets against the panes and smashed through them with a great shattering of glass and spouted out of the gaping holes thus made in huge roaring tongues of flame. There was light in the streets and on the ivy-clad small homes in the gardens, the terrifying orange-red light of fire. There were shadows, the gigantic black shadows of the trees wavering as the flames wavered, the shadows of humans, arms flung overhead, shouting shadows, screaming shadows, pelting toward the blaze. Shouts and screams and the roar of the flames, and always through the roar, that terrible laugh. God, Hal Curtin gasped, held a tight within his arm. I haven't the ghost of a chance. Those who'd been strolling on Blossom Street were past them, those coming from farther off had not yet reached them, and for breathless seconds the lovers were isolated. Oh, they're done for. Look, the girl throbbed. Look! Her free hand flung out to the ridgepole of the blazing house. There! 
against sky glare was blackly silhouetted a thing, man form yet grotesquely not a man. On the narrow crest of the slanted roof that was not yet alight, it capered in a queerly simian frenzy, and it was from that capering monstrosity that the brain curdling laugh came. From the dark human mass surging against the fence of the doomed house, surging away from the blasting heat of that furnace, a shout went up. Curtin could not know whether it was evoked by sight of the thing on the roof or by the explosion of flame through the black roof slant. The house was a vast torch now, a pillar of seething orange and crimson and strange green supporting on its apex the affrighted vault of the sky within which nothing could live. Nothing. Hal tore himself away from Hilda's clinging hands, a strange cry in his throat. He vaulted the pickets beside them, his leap a lithe and effortless bound, and was hurling away from her. His feet thudded into soft garden loam, and in his nostrils was a sweet fragrance of honeysuckle. His toes flung the crunch of path cinders behind him. He whipped past the red-bathed porch of a small home, past its end wall whose dark ivy strove to shield it from the lurid glare. He was beyond it, on the soft turf of its kitchen yard, angling toward the roar whence that glare came, and had plunged into the shadow of the next house, Stygian by contrast. Blinded, Curtin battered into a black hedge he could not see, was ripped by its stems, its stiff leaves, as he burst through it into blackness. Tall grass whipped his legs, and he knew he was in the vacant lots that lie between Stolton and the fields. He halted for a moment to get his bearings, projected almost useless sight, taut hearing, into the gloom that was the deeper because overlaid by the rubid heavens. Somewhere within that murk was furtive movement. There, almost straight ahead, was a darkening of the black. Hal launched himself at the vague forms, wrath wrenching a shout from his lips. The forms were plainer. His ankle was caught by some ground creeper, pulled from under him, he lurched forward into a blow that exploded white light within his skull. Hilda Mead squatted in the tall grass, reckless of her filmy white frock. Ha! <sighs> she whimpered. How? I thought I'd never find you. Her hands tugged at the recumbent form, tugged its head onto her knees. How? Her fingers found wetness on that head, viscid wetness matting the hair, staining her fingers. Oof! Curtin winced, jerking his head from the fierce pain of that touch. Don't. And then, Hilda, you... Uh... Hell, what was it? What were you chasing? Who did this to you? I saw. He checked himself. Hilda, don't ask me what I saw. Don't let me tell you. How? you're still dazed. You're talking wildly. No. Curtin pushed hands against the ground, pushed himself to a sitting posture. No, I'm not dazed. I, Hilda, you must not know. It'll be dangerous for you to know. Something in his tone told the girl there was utter truth in these words that otherwise was so mad. And listen, tell no one it was... Uh, no one how I got this cut on my head. Say that I started to run to the fire, tripped and banged my skull. Perhaps, perhaps I was not seen clearly, was not recognized. It was fear that sounded in Hal's voice, and Hilda had not dreamed that he could ever be so afraid. Do you understand? No, she said. I don't understand, but I'll do as you say. A crash poured their eyes to where the fire had blazed. Sparks fountained above the dull red glow that was all that was left of the blaze. High into the sky they went, till they were golden stars dancing in the heavens, and then they were drifting down again upon Stalton. Hilda Mead had a queer fancy that they were tiny lanterns, guiding a horde of imps to their landing place. Part 2. Disaster 
It was not till long after dawn that the ruins of the house on Blossom Street had cooled sufficiently to permit inspection, and the full extent of the horror made certain. The searchers found the skeletons then, in the jumble of charred timbers that once had been a home, enough for the incinerated bones to identify whose they were when the Holocaust seared life from them. There were five of them, five heaps of whitened ashes. Uh, that's the full count, the haggard-faced fire chief said when he'd received the last report from one of his men. Not one escaped. How could they? John Wayne, village president, responded. Where that fire burst out. He was tall and gnarled and sturdy as an oak. His hatless white hair was smudged by the embers that had drifted into it while the blaze still burned, for he'd been early on the scene. Uh, they tell me it was everywhere at once, upstairs and down. His grizzled, kindly countenance was grey with distress. Everywhere. Uh, that's what got me, Chief Rail muttered. It was a wooden house, sure enough, but it was all well built and should have resisted the flames if I know anything at all. I'd understand it if they'd been cut off in a single room, but from the position of the bodies and the things around them, oh, the maid was in the kitchen washing dishes. Bob Dutton and the boy were in the living room, Mary upstairs in the nursery. And the baby? Oh, the baby was in its crib, Rail said softly. Mary... The way she lies tells us. She threw herself over it to save it. Even with the flames around her, as they must have been, the mother did that. A murmur went through the group of mourning neighbors that, silent save for a shifting of uneasy feet and an occasional muffled sob, had been listening to the report. In the depths of Hal Curtin's brown eyes, a smolder of wrath deepened, and the line of his blunt jaw hardened to a knotted ridge. He moved closer to Wayne and Rail, addressed the latter. Chief, he asked, low-toned. Are you sure that was all who were in the house? The man turned to him. Uh, we've rigged the ashes clean and that's all we've found. <laughs> that isn't what I mean. I thought there might... Oh, that someone might have escaped. I know the family's all accounted for, but there might have been some visitor. There wasn't none. A pillow-bosomed woman, Lena Corbett, put in. I was just in there to ask Mary for a dress pattern I knew she had, and there wasn't anyone but Bob and little Bob and her around. And there couldn't have been anybody come in, because I was scarcely back to my own gate two doors away when the thing happened. Um, in the kitchen, maybe. Someone calling on the maid. Nope. I went to the door to ask Jenny for a glass of water, and I saw the whole room. There wasn't anybody. Well, that was that, then. The capering figure on the roof was unexplained. The figure that had laughed, not in glee, but in agony. No one had mentioned it, hence no one but he and Hilda had seen it. But that was reasonable. The spectator's gaze had been riveted on the flame-filled windows. Where did you ask that? Rail inquired. What's on your mind, Hal? Gurdon shrugged. Um, nothing. No. Why had he lied? He had intended to tell them of what he'd seen. Just a hunch I had. He glanced at the watch on his wrist. It's late. I've got to begin to work, much as I don't feel like it. The knot of watches broke up as he walked away, reminded of waiting offices and workrooms, of housework to be done and children to be sent off to school. But those children were kissed more lingeringly that morning, more reluctantly dispatched. Infants too young for school were held tightly to their mother's breasts. How? Hilda's dear voice called his name. She was at the gate of her home, halfway down the block, fresh and sweet in a filmy negligee, her eyes still dewy with sleep. Hal, I saw you. Is your head all right? She touched the plastered bandage that made a white patch in his shock of chestnut hair. I had to run out and ask. Quite all right, darling. His brown, strong hand closed on her fingers, took them to his lips. I haven't even a headache left. Well, I was awake for a long time. I was thinking, could that thing we saw have had anything to do with what happened? That puffball. Good Lord, that's a queer idea. 
Curtin was queerly uneasy. I mean, what earth could it? He had an obscure sensation of eyes upon him, watching, evil eyes. He half turned to the street with careful carelessness, calculated not to alarm his sweetheart. Oh, it couldn't, of course. He heard her. Uh, of course it couldn't. Nobody was watching him. There was no one who had any reason to watch him. They were all familiar, all friendly, warm-hearted people who'd been his neighbours and friends. Yeah, that's more sensible. He leaned over the gate, kissed Hilda full on her sweet, warm mouth. Bye, love. Um, i got to go and tend to business. She held him a moment longer. How? She breathed. I want to ask you something. Yeah? Did you mean what you said last night? That you'll protect me from anything? All my life, from the devil and all his imps. His voice was deep, as if he suddenly had some prescience of how soon he was to be called upon to fulfill almost literally that promise. The second puffball was seen by many of the townspeople. It appeared in Main Street at 3.15 that afternoon, when traffic there was at its height. It bounded straight down the center of the street, and it was the way that it avoided the rolling wheels of the autos, the trampling hooves of the farmer's horses that drew amused eyes, and pointing fingers to it. The wind was stronger than it had been on the previous evening, and the bit of fungus was much like a tiny, pallid animal scudding legless and armless before it. It was shooting across the intersection of Apple Street when Hal Curtin, driving back to his law office from the town hall, spied it. Unaccountably, his skin crawled with sudden apprehension. Almost without volition, he skidded his roadster into Main Street and darted after the swiftly rolling thing like a terrier after a rat. The instant before, his mind had still been filled with the scene in the village's council room. John Wayne had presided with unaccustomed solemnity, the morning's tragedy brooding in his eyes. Curtin himself, butcher Rudolf Schalk, portly, ruddy-cheeked, Gaunt and assiduous Dr. Adam Rainier, and Stephen Brynn, pompous with the dignity of his bank, had sat slouched deep in their chairs, attentive but wordless. But there had been debate verging on acrimony at that meeting. The protagonists had been fussy little Mark Yarrow, the druggist, and the realtor, Red and Gast. The issue, approved by the council of a great trunk highway proposed to run through Stoughton's very centre, Gast was violently in favour. Yarrow opposed. Bryn and Rainier were lined up with the realtor, Schalk and Curtin with Yarrow. That left Wayne with the deciding vote, and there was no doubt of how that would be cast. Stolton was the old man's very life. Its tree-lined streets, its neat white homes, its peaceful atmosphere of neighbourliness created almost by his very hands. When he'd first come here, the town had been a rambling, dingy hamlet, a trading centre for the farmer's roundabout, and nothing more. By his influence, by his unremitting toil, it had become what it was. A trunk route through it would bring turmoil and confusion, a mushroom growth of gas stations and hot dog stands and roadhouses, a stench of exhaust fumes by day and a clamour of honking horns by night. Yet such was the fairness, the passion for justice of the man that, because Garst and his party saw prosperity for Stolton in the change, he'd agreed to reserve the vote given him only in case of a tie, so they had had every opportunity to win over one of those who thought as he did. Wayne had gone further. He had offered to resign from his presidency and call a special election in which he would run against anyone Garst chose. This, however, the realtor had refused, <laughs> Knowing well enough that no matter what the question, John Wayne would be re-elected by an overwhelming margin, so dearly loved was he by the people of Stolton. Gast preferred, however, to attempt to win his side one of those who was not too strongly opposed to the idea. If he succeeded, his paltry land holdings would become a veritable gold mine. Wealth, then, had been the gauge for which Redden Gast had battled his alpaca coat hanging in loose folds on his huge, raw bone frame, his countenance granite-hard and expressionless, except for the faint sneer of his lifted lip at Mark Yarrow, his predatory eyes contemptuous of the little man whose Van Dyke had bristled and voice grown shrill and stuttering. 
Hal Curtin had watched the dispute with a curious intentness he was careful to mask, with a curious excitement manifested only by the throb of a pulse in his temple. If he'd only be sure of what he'd seen last night, just before that terrific blow had smashed him into oblivion. There had been no decision. Gast, sensing that he had made no progress, had demanded another week's consideration. Curtin had left the town hall with that pump of blood still in his temple, had driven mechanically east with a strange, unbelievable speculation throbbing in his skull. And then he saw that small puffball scuttering up Main Street, and Hilda's queer remark of the morning flashed out of memory. It kept just ahead of his car's hood, a bounding irregular sphere all but animate. He recalled Hilda's words. Alive with a queer kind of life. It knows where it's going. Something grated along the side of his roadster, caught a fender, let go. The puffball leaped sideways, darted toward the sidewalk, darted across it and straight into the lobby of a movie theatre whose canopy was overhung with flamboyant signs proclaiming Kitty's Matinee, Mickey Mouse Rustlers of Sunset Range, Episode 8 Kitty's Matinee Hal jammed his brakes, hurled out of his car, hurtled into the lobby A swirl of grey smoke, a spore puff of the fungus lay against the white base of the door into the auditorium Curtin's palm slapped the door, fingers grabbed his arm, and a voice rasped. Ticket, mister! Blackness billowed through the aperture between door edge and jam, as if an inky fog that filled the interior were finding exit. Where's your... Uh... The door was blasted outward by a thunderous crash. Screams came with the thunder, and the black fog was suddenly solid with plaster dust. These children were screaming. Children in terror. Children in pain. A laugh threaded the chorus of agony. It was that same chattering mad laugh he'd heard not many hours before. A laugh whose sound had never quite died out of Hal Curtin's brain. The doorman's clutch was a desperate, insensate grip on his arm. He ripped loose from it, battered the door out of his way, plunged through it into an impenetrable darkness, dust-filled and filled with shrill cries, with whimpers, with other sounds indescribable, and with that damned laugh. Curtin jerked to a halt, bewildered by the sightless void. Abruptly, the black fog seemed to dissipate. A glow spread through it, and he could make out jumbled timbers, small forms inextricably entangled with them, Small form struggling, jerking feebly, and not moving at all. Realization of what had happened beat in on Hal. The balcony had fallen with its load of children on the children below. Not all the balcony. No, the projection booth was still erect on its stilts, still streaming from its square window. White light which caught the swirling dust and cast a murky glow by which he saw the broken little body. Horrified, he saw a tiny hand reach out from between two shattered beams, its wee fingers gloved with blood, twitching. The laugh beat at his brain, the laugh so weirdly evil with insane pain. Where did it come from? Who could be laughing in this hell? Men and shouts poured through the door behind Curtin, battered him, and caught him up in their swirl. Men were clawing at the chaos, cursing, sobbing, frantic with horror and with grief. A voice, scarcely human, jabbered. Lila! Where's my Lila? She's in here! The dust swirl, heavy, was settling, the cloud thinning. The light from the projection booth was gathering into a sharp-edged beam boring through the terrible darkness. Its end was a great white square on the further wall. This was the screen that should be displaying an antic rodent. On it, black, shaggy and grotesque, capered the gigantic shadow of that which laughed. Part 3 The Third Puffball 
Hal Curtin was abruptly aware that somehow he'd struggled far down toward that screen, dragged there perhaps by his stunned, unthinking search for the source of the laugh. He must have clambered over the worst of the wreckage, for there was little here. The seats were empty, open exit doors showing where those who'd occupied these seats and still were able to move had gone. Behind him was the terrible clamor of disaster and rescue, Ahead of him, that shadow on the screen, and on the stage-like narrow platform just before the screen, the thing that cast it. It danced its evil rigadoon, laughing. Kurt invented an incoherent shout, threw himself down the aisle. His weaponless fingers were clawed, his throat swollen with the terrible anger that possessed him. Beneath his tongue was a salt-sweet taste of blood. He passed the final seat row, glanced up at the high-rise of the stage front close before him, and jumped for its summit. His hands caught the platform edge and clung. The momentum of his leap carried his torso high enough so that he could straighten his arms, get a toehold, lift and come erect on the little stage. He was alone on it, and the laughter had vanished. Dazzled by the reflection from the screen's silver surface, Curtin started to turn. The flooring went from beneath his feet, and he dropped plummet-like into darkness. Well, there is no consciousness of time in a sudden fall, only marrow-freezing terror. A split second or many minutes might have elapsed before Howe crashed onto solid support. Jarred, half-dazed, he contrived to flail gritty hands, already fisted, to fight whatever it was that had trapped him. He was on his feet, when surprisingly, a black shape loomed in the blackness. Before Curtin could move, there was a click, yellow light. Redden gasped, his hand on a switch, panting. What is it? What happened in the theater? I heard a crash from my office, ran out the back way, through the alley, and in here. Metal armored cables twisted reptilian in the confined space, undulated upward to black, cone-like objects over Gast's head. What happened, Hal? Ah, oh, you look... Hal realized there were loudspeakers behind the screen. This was the chamber beneath it where they were adjusted. The fall of Hal's had brought him only level with the theater floor. Happened? He gasped. Enough. But did you see anything, anyone coming out of here? A man like a huge ape. Ape? The realtor stared at him, his eyes widening as though with doubt on the other's sanity. No, of course not. No one passed me. What's that? A woman's wail, pent with excruciating suffering, came through the overhead aperture through which Hal had fallen. What's going on in there? The balcony fell. The answer came absently, without intonation. Hundreds of children killed. Great Jupiter! Gast, lurched past Curtin, was heaving up a vertical iron ladder that came down from the trapdoor through which the lawyer had fallen. Well, the rest of that afternoon was a blur to Curtin. Afterwards, he had a dim memory of helping to lift great beams, of carrying limp and moaning small forms tenderly in his arms, of laying lifeless bodies in a lengthening, terrible row. He was not quite clear-minded again till he found himself in the kitchen of Hilda's home on Blossom Street. Weariness, a dull ache in his muscles and his bones, his brain a boil of dark and dreadful thoughts, black as the night, pressing against the unshaded window. Eat this salad, darling, Hilda was saying. Look, I made it for you just the way you like. Only white meat, nice crisp lettuce, and plenty of mayonnaise. Here's an iced tea. Well, you must eat or you'll be sick. He looked up at her from his chair at the kitchen table. You made it, he said dully. Where's Ethel? The girl smiled through the glimmer of tears in her eyes. I told you. She answered with tender patience that Ethel went to the hospital where her little brother is and that dad and mother are out seeing what they can do to help with the widow Simpson, whose son and daughter both were killed this afternoon. 
Yeah, her lover muttered. Yeah, I remember. Because Hilda seemed to want it so much, he reached for the dainty plate she'd prepared. His sleeve brushed a crumpled newspaper on the table. The lurid headlines leaked from the page at him. Forty killed. Scores heard in theater crash. Balcony claps blamed on lax inspection. Gast accuses President Wayne of weakness. Link's failure to find cause of Blossom Street fire and demands thorough investigation. Gast accuses, Curtin exclaimed, jumping to his feet. Gast demands. He stared wild-eyed at the startled girl. But it was Gast who was in the sound room. Gast who said he saw no one come out of it. I've got it, Hilda. By God, I've got it, and I'm going to stop it. He whirled, was running through the dining room, was through the hall and out on the porch. He was in his roadster, parked outside, and was pounding his heel on the starter. The car jumped away from the curb, roared off, roared past the blackened ruins of the house where five had been seared to death, past houses still standing that were blackened with heart-rending grief, or with an anguish of doubt more poignant than mourning. Last night, Hal Curtin thought, little children were laughing inside those houses. Laughing? Oh, twice he'd heard another kind of laugh. How did that fit into the dark pattern that had formed in his mind? He twisted his heel, changing his course. To fill out that pattern, there was a bit of information he must obtain, and Mark Yarrow would have it for him. The little druggist was the village gossip. The loungers in the pharmacy were pallid tonight, their faces sultry with recollection of the scenes they'd witnessed not long since. There was little talk from their tight-lipped mouths, but what there was, was of John Wayne and how he had failed them. I've got a hunch there's plenty more due to happen, someone said. The way the town's gone to rack and ruin lately, I've got a feeling in my bones this ain't the last. Ah, cut it, Bill, another protested. Ain't we got enough to think about? But the first speaker had voiced the sense of impending doom, the prescience of further disaster that brooded over all Stalton. Ancestral fears were revived tonight in the morning town, incohate as these might have been in the souls of their ancestors. The gods were wroth with them, and prepared their destruction. The gods must be appeased by a human sacrifice, and that sacrifice was ready to their hand. Well, I say we all ought to go up to John Wayne's and... That sentence was interrupted by the entrance of Hal Curtin. Disheveled, his eyes burned out coals in a yeasty mask. He strode stiff-legged through them. He shouldered them aside from his path, and none took offence because it was so evident he didn't know he had done so. He went straight through the back of the store, past the end of the counter that closed off its public space, through the swinging door and into the partition behind it. Mark Yarrow dapper in a white half-smock, looked up from the pills he was rolling to see the apparition stride into his prescription room. Before his indignation at the intrusion could find more expression than the pursing of his lips, a hand had clutched his collar and thick words were choking off his own utterance. Mark, Curtin demanded, tell me, has Redden gassed any connection with the county madhouse? He gasped. Yeah, he's on the board and he leased the place to the county. That's one of his little grafts, and why? He was left with a question unfinished, his mouth gaping like a pelter fish's. Hal Curtin had wheeled away and was gone. God, he heard an exclamation from outside. What's eating you? And then the hammer of heels across the floor out there was ended, to be succeeded an instant later by the of an auto starter and the clash of gears viciously meshed. The night seemed darker to Hal Curtin, and more foreboding, as he catapulted through the village, retracing his course. A block from Hilda's, he braked again, sat for a minute with clenched hands, with the lips biting hard on one another. He must get control of himself, must speak coherently, convincingly. 
that which he was about to say would be difficult enough to get across without the impediment of its being said by one who looked as if he were on the brink of madness. Mark Yarrow's expression had told him what he looked like. There was a comb somewhere in his pocket. He fumbled for it, used it. He adjusted his tie, straightened his coat. These small actions helped to reduce the fever in his blood, the pounding in his temples, and now he could trust himself. He got out of the roadster, walked quite slowly up the path that led through a garden to the colonial entrance of a small but somehow stately white house. He read the name in letters of wrought iron set in the weathered boards of the door. John Wayne. His hand did not tremble as he lifted the knocker and rapped once with it. The door opened more quickly than he'd expected. It was Wayne himself who opened it. The sight of his countenance, ashen, haggard, the visage of an almost senile ancient now, and not that of gracious age, undid all Hal Curtin had accomplished with himself. Mr. Wayne, he blurted, I've come to tell you. I know who's behind what's happening in town. Well, I've seen it. Something flared into Wayne's sunken eyes. Something that silenced Curtin more surely than the old man's... Wait a minute, Hal. Come in. And then there was another voice from behind Wayne. Oh, looks like I'd better cut my good night short, John. Well, we understand each other, don't we? The old man turned to Redden Ghast. Yes, he said. Yes, Redden, I understand. Thank you for coming. They were shaking hands. Gast was passing Curtin with a curt nod. Oh, did Hal imagine it? Or was there dark flame in the pouch under late eyes that caught his own briefly? Flame of a hellish hate. What was he doing here? Curtin croaked. What did he want? Wayne smiled wearily. We, um, came to apologize for what he said to the Gazette's reporter. He was excited. Didn't mean it. He doesn't honestly blame me for well, the fire and the accident, and he's going to make a statement tomorrow retracting what he said today. Phew, after the damage is done, Curtin commented bitterly. After he's set Stalton against you as he planned from the beginning. Yeah, you're through now. They'll demand your resignation, and some creature of his will be elected which is exactly why he's done what he has. He wants that highway and the fortune it means for him, and he stopped at nothing to get it, not even at murder. John Wayne took a step backward into the open doorway, one almost transparent hand lifting as if to ward off an attack. What? the old man whispered. What do you mean? Just that. Ghast is responsible for the fire on Blossom Street for the collapse of the theatre balcony. If those are not enough, he's ready to perpetrate another outrage. All this to discredit you, to get you out of the way. You're... You're upset, my boy. What you say is impossible. I mean, those were accidents. The hell, they were accidents. Look! The words were tumbling out of Curtin's mouth now. The words that had been pounding in his skull. If that house were filled with lycopodium... A haze of fine powder, well, no one would have noticed. If a match was struck, it would have blazed up all at once the way it did. A very little dynamite placed under the supporting pillars of the theater balcony would have brought it down. Now, Gast had access to dynamite. He's blasting foundations for that office building on Apple Street, and he could have... Oh, what are you saying? I've known Redden for years. Gast couldn't... No, not gassed with his own hands, but gassed in the person of some madman he released from the asylum. I've seen him. I know him anywhere. I saw him in the theater and he got away. I saw him before that on the roof of the burning house. Saw him leave for the telephone wires just before the final burst of flame came, then dropped to the ground. Oh, I almost caught him that time. Would have if there hadn't been someone with him who clouded me. Hal... Wayne interrupted. That's it. You were hurt more badly than you thought when you fell that night. And your experience today finished the job. Just go home. Get some sleep. Tomorrow you'll be rid of these wild ideas. 
I can prove it to you. I can. I'm almost certain. I can show you the madman. Got an idea where he's hiding. Those puffballs that have been appearing just before each thing happens can come only from Roger's wood. He brings them. That's where his lair is. We'll organize a posse and go there and capture him. And that'll prove my ideas aren't as wild as you think. Yeah, look, yeah, I know. They seem so logical now, but after you've slept, you'll see how fantastic they are. Look, I'll go grab my hat and take you home. Wait here. The door shut between them as if the old man were frightened of his visitor and wished a solid barrier for protection. God, Curtin groaned, his hands fisting at his sides. God help me, God help Stalton. He turned to go back to his roadster with some idea of running back to Yarrow's, of telling his tale to the men there, beginning to form in his desperation. On the sidewalk, bounding along with a noiseless swiftness now terrible to him, was a puffball. It shot by and went on up the street. Something more was about to happen. Some new horror was coming to one of the houses on Blossom Street. Hilda Mead's house was in the direction of the puffball. Was that the house that was marked for doom? Part 4 The Dark Cloak's Death Hal Curtin was running, but it seemed to him he made no progress at all along that quiet street. That, as in a nightmare, the faster he ran, the more firmly he was rooted to the spot where he was. And always fifty feet before him bounded the pallid bit of fluff he could not overtake, though overtaking it meant so terribly much. Abruptly, it veered, as he'd seen too exactly like it veer. It was Hilda's gate, open as he himself had left it, through which the thing darted. It was Hilda's garden pathway up which it scuttered. Hilda's porch steps it struck to puff out of existence in a grey swirl of spore dust. As he flung himself up the path, icy terror gelled Hal Curtin's veins. But nothing happened. The structure that housed the girl he loved did not burst into flame, did not collapse, did not, as he half expected, vanish as the puffball had in a swirl of grey smoke. He gasped through the relief as he leaped the porch steps, seized the doorknob, jerked the portal open and flung through into the foyer that had known the kisses and the whisperings of so many lingering good nights. He gasped again with terror, finding himself in black darkness, with even the street lamp light close behind blotted out. This was not merely the absence of light. This was blackness that swallowed sight, which swallowed reality itself and left nothing but terror. This was the black fog that had filled the house up the road just before the lurid flames had made it a roaring furnace. The fog that had swirled out of the theatre auditorium just before its balcony had crashed. And now it was here. And somewhere within it was... Hilda! Her name burst from Hal Curtin's clam throat. Hilda! There was no answer. Hilda! His cry was quenched by vacant silence, by the muffled hush of doom. Was there, somewhere ahead, the faint shadow of a laugh, of a chattering, mad laugh? The head, from the kitchen where he'd left Hilda, there was a glow, vague, vertical, and narrow. It was light, blessed light, seeping past the edge of the kitchen door. Curtin's footfalls made hollow, empty echoes in the empty house. He flung into the kitchen, the lit kitchen, halted. No Hilda, not even her body, as he'd feared, dead in some awful way. No, no sign of her at all. But the table at which he'd sat was overturned. A chair had been smashed by a struggle, a fragment of her flowered dress caught in its splinters and the back door swung open to the mystery of the night. That was all. The table, the chair, the door. No, not quite all. There was something chalked on the scrubbed white tile of the floor. Letters scrawled crudely in crimson chalk and obscured by the breakfast cloth that had slid from the table. 
Hal Curtin twitched the gay cloth aside, and he read the message. Curtin, you keep your damn mouth shut if you want to see her again. He stood there looking at it, the tablecloth trailing from his clenched hand, his mouth working. He had brought this upon her. He, his damn mouth, blurting a warning to Red and Gast, not waiting to ascertain that he was alone with Wayne, giving Gast time to hasten here and... God, how had Gast dared? If he'd been seen entering or found here when Hilda's parents returned? No, it was not Gast who'd entered here. Not Gast. A clearing of Curtin's vision had revealed to him something more caught in the splintered end of that chair than the bit torn from Hilda's dress. Oh, not very much, just a wisp of black hair, of short hairs black and coarse and kinked. It was not Red and Gast who'd held Hilda Mead prisoner, but Gast's tool, his mad creature who'd capered in the midst of horror, laughing a weird and insane laugh. And that was worse far worse. A madman knows no set design, no fixed purpose. He's swayed by sudden impulses, by the surge of mindless frenzies, of insane lusts. I'll always protect you. Curtin's own oath sounded in his ears, against Satan and all his imps. Protect her. She was in the hands of a mad thing, his Hilda, her rounded warm body, her soft curves, prisoner to a thing half human perhaps, perhaps all beast, subject to his whims and his will. Find her. Save her. Save her before it was too late. Curtin's mind shuddered away from the thought of the peril his loved one was in. Find her, but where? How? Gast knew. He whirled, about to dash out to Gast, to choke the truth from him, to tear him limb from limb if he would not give it. And it would take time, valuable time. Hilda's captor could not have gotten far as yet. By the time he'd drag the truth from Red and Gast, they'd be God knows how far away. God knew what would have occurred before he could reach them. But he had no choice. Wait. Once more the tortured man recalled his own words, more recently spoken. Those puffballs. Roger's wood. That's where his lair is. I'll take you there. Roger's wood. Five miles across the fields. But they were gone only ten minutes, fifteen at the most. That was all it was since Gast had left Wayne's. If he went after them at once, no time to get help, no time to get a weapon. He might overtake them, might reach the madman's lair at least before. Hal Curtin whirled again, went sprinting out of the kitchen door, out into the lonely night. Well, Hal Curtin never knew how long it took him to run those five lightless miles over rough fields, up hills that became mountains in the dark, splashing through streams, sliding, gasping, torn by his own breathing, torn by thorns of berry bushes, by barbed wire unseen, till he was upon it. But he raced through, a featureless chiaroscuro of shadows, feeling his hurts not at all, feeling not at all that the clothes were torn from him, that he was lacerated and bleeding, that an iron band was about his chest and the hammers of hell beating upon his skull. Part 5. The House of Horror Somewhere in that nightmare flight, there was the thrumming of a far-off auto. Somewhere in that Gethsemane, there were twin beams of distant headlights scything the darkness. And then there was the loom of black woods ahead of him, and he was in their earth-odorous dankness, and he was slowing to a halt. Careful now, he must be careful. If the madman heard him, got warning of his approach, Hilda would be... Hal was weaponless. He had only his arms and his fists to use against the Lord alone knew what insane strength. The advantage of surprise must be his. Surprise, but how? 
there was impenetrable darkness here. There was only the shrill piping of cicadas and the scutterings of the wood's night kind. There was a glimmer of light, far within the tree-deep and blackness. Cautiously, with an instinctive woodsmanship called out of racial memory by his great need, with a taut check on his urge to run, shouting, to the source of that light, Hal Curtin crept up. He reached it at long last, at last was crouched at the edge of a tiny clearing, was gazing with aching eyes at a tumble-down cabin of crumbling logs, some shelter left by ancient lumbermen, through whose gaping chinks came the gleam that had brought him here. Only for an instant, Curtin crouched there. Then he stole across the narrow space between and flattened himself against the moss-slimy wall. He peered through a crack in the shack's interior. He could only see a small portion of it, but that was enough. A candle guttered within the hovel. By its wavering, weird luminance, he saw Hilda. Two roughly hewn beams had sometime fallen from the decrepit cabin's roof. They slanted now from roof to earth and floor. The girl lay on one of these, lashed to it hand and foot, half covered by the rags to which her neat, crisp frock, her dainty undergarments had now been reduced. She was as yet unharmed, or physically at least. All concealment had been torn from one rounded breast. Her arms, her olive rounded thighs, strained at the lashings that cut into their soft, warm flesh. In her fear-widened eyes, there was ineffable horror. Grotesque and horrible as the creature had appeared when capering on a blazing roof, when laughing from the stage of a smashed theatre, he was now utterly appalling. Clad only in ragged trousers, his body was the scarred wreck of a frame once clean-cut and stalwart. It was malformed with a rottenness not so much of its tissues as of the soul within it and shaggy with hair black and kinked and matted as a wild beast's fur. His straddled, columnar legs, his big, thewed arms, bulged with swollen muscles. His unshaved, black, bristled countenance was high-browed, its features finely chiseled, but it was empty of all intelligence, of all emotion save the vapid, long-toothed grin of a mindless idiot while its skin twitched with tiny spasms, as though beneath it vermin scuttered and pinched it with their microscopic jaws. He towered above the bound, half-naked girl, his lips drooling, his soulless eyes repeating their imbecile grin. It was as if he were calling upon her to witness the cleverness of that which he was about. With a curious deafness, one of his great paws juggled three of the puffballs that had accumulated so much of terrible meaning for Hal Curtin, catching and tossing the fragile globules so that they didn't burst, but danced in the wavering light. In and out and about the flickering balls, he flashed the braided metal lash of a small whip in gleaming, intricate maneuvers. The madman missed one of the puffballs, and it dropped on Hilda, touched her just where the ragged edge of her torn slip lay against her abdomen's throbbing skin. Her captor snatched at it, his spatulate fingers, clumsy now, caught in the pink fabric, and there was a ripping sound. The ball struck the floor and burst. Not spore dust, but rather a black cloud spurted from it, billowed upward to meet the other two that were still floating down. The madman's frenzied fingers were ripping the last vestige of clothing from Hilda, and she screamed. Her scream came to Curtin out of blackness that enveloped her, that was filling the cabin, the blackness that had been spewed from the burst puffball from the two others. He thrust himself away from the wall, whirled to hurl himself along it to search for a door. There must be a door somewhere by which he could get inside, get to Hilda, fight for her. There was no longer any light. The candle must have gone out. No, not out. Its light quenched by the black fog of the puffballs, by the material blackness that was pouring out through the chinks between the logs. Clouds darker than the forest darkness, darker than evil. There was no light, so Curtin had to guide himself by a hand against the log wall, while from behind the wall came the screams of the girl he loved, and the bestial snufflings of the man-beast too. He came to a corner, whirled around it, saw a billow of the Stygian vapor pouring out of the door he saw. 
he vented something between a groan and a shout, and then plunged through it into sightlessness that was alive with sound. Hilda shrieks fainter now, and the sound of rending cloth, snuffling and horrible snarls. Stop it! The yell tore Hal's throat. God damn you, he yelled. Stop it! Hurtling towards those sounds, blinded by the eye-blinding black. Stop! A heavy blow smashed the back of his head, smashed into his skull. He spun down and down into oblivion. Hal Curtin's head ballooned with pain that expanded within it, as though to burst it. Because of the pain, he could not move, though he tried to lift his hand to his head to that still throbbing torture. It wasn't because of the pain that he couldn't lift his hand. As returning consciousness became surer, he was aware of tightness about his wrists. He was bound, wrists and ankles, to a heavy beam. He opened his eyes. A wall slanted toward him at a mad angle. An earthen floor slanted up toward him. The guttering light through which he saw them held a curious quality of darkness, as though it were strained through a black mist. This was unreal, dreamlike. Somebody moaned beside him. Curtin's head rolled to the sound. It was Hilda who'd moaned. Hilda, naked, a grey pallor underlying a skin that was crisscrossed with red and angry wheels. Her eyes were closed. She was lashed to a beam that slanted downward from above. Curtin realised that he too was lashed to a beam similarly slanted. But it was he and not the wall, the floor, that lay at this unaccustomed angle. Hilda, he managed only a whisper. She didn't move. There were ropes around her ankles, her wrists, but there was also a rope around her neck. This did not go around the beam on which she lay. It went straight up. It went over a hook in the broken ceiling and came down again. Its other end was fastened to the beam to which Hal Curtin himself was bound, and it was just short of tautness. Beneath Hilda's ear, the looped rope was tied with a hangman's slipknot. Hilda! She didn't hear him. Could she hear him? Or was she... She has fainted, someone said. The voice oddly familiar. But she'll come out of it in a moment. Curtin jumped upon hearing it. The timber supporting him rocked. Its upper end started to slip from the crossbeam holding it. Slipping off that crossbeam. A quarter inch more, and it would come down, jerking tight the rope fastened to it, jerking tight the noose around Hilda's neck, strangling her. It didn't, though. Not this time. Something steadied it, stopped that fearful rocking. A hand, Curtin saw as his head rolled, a great callous paw with black, kinky hair on the backs of its fingers. He saw the owner of that hand, the madman. That fatuous leering grin was still on the creature's face. In his other hand was still the metal lash with which he toyed with the puffballs that had spewed the blackness. The same voice spoke again from behind Curtin, where he could not see the speaker. The next time Jock will let the timber come down, it said, and you'll know what that'll do. Well, it may interest you to know that all the cords with which you are tied may be broken with not too great effort. You can free yourself, but not quickly enough to stop the beam from falling. And there it was. Al Curtin was imprisoned not by lashings that he might break, but by the knowledge that his escape meant Hilda's death. Oh, you fiend, he grunted. Who are you? He'd heard that voice before, many times. Was it because of his physical and mental agony that he couldn't identify it? It was... No. It couldn't be. Not red and ghasts. Well, who's then? Come around here where I can see you. The madman jock was drawing his whip between his fingers lovingly. What did he mean to do with it? What in the name of Satan was he going to do with that braided metal thong? So that you can see me? The voice mused. Well, it hardly matters now whether you see me or not. 
You'll tell no one who I am, and your reaction will amuse us, perhaps, while we wait for your sweetheart to awaken. There was a shuffle of feet on the hard-packed earthen floor. There was a flicker of Jock's eyes to the sound, the look of a fawning dog coming into them. And then a man moved into the range of Hal Curtin's vision. He was tall and gnarled. His hair was a lustrous white mane, crowning a face seen by deep lines, sunken-cheeked with eyes that now gleamed wildly. Wayne! burst from Hal Curtin's lips. Wayne gave a humorous smile. Clever of you to recognize me. As clever as you're guessing how that fire was started, and how the theater balcony was brought down, and that this was Jock's lair. You're a very clever man, Hal Curtin. I wonder if you've reasoned out the connection of the puffballs with all that has happened. Curtin's brow knitted. Well, perhaps by humoring his captor, he would gain enough time to work out some escape for Hilda from this imprisonment, from the threat of the last jock fondled. Well, they're not quite uh, natural, the blackness. Some variation in them has increased their spore puff to a vast cloud of blackness. Perhaps the puffballs were treated chemically and crossed with unknown varieties. This cloud cloaked jock when he was set in the fire, when he was mining the theater balcony. Not jock, Wayne grinned. Not Jock, he was to be the scapegoat, the whipping boy, taking the blame if some human agency were uncovered in connection with the disasters. The spore cloud clogged me, Hal Curtin. It was I who... You, the bound man gasped. The unbelievable truth against which his mind had rebelled was now stark and inescapable. You're the one. Yes. Wayne's features were no longer kindly. They were dark and contorted with evil triumph, and evil leered from beneath his shaggy brow. I set the fire. I mined the balcony. He laughed, and there was the same fierce pain in his laugh as in Chuck's. You, Curtin groaned. But, but why? Why? Tiny lightworms crawled in Wayne's slitted eyes. You can ask that when... But I forgot. You were not born when Stolten damned my brother to horror. Your brother? The old man's tortured look went to Jock, who was leaning forward now, his avid tongue licking his lips, his burning look fastened on Hilda's nude beauty. They were too uh, penurious to pave the streets, Wayne grated. Jock, a fine young lad, slipped in the mud as he played, sprawled into the gutter. The hoof of a passing horse just flicked his skull and made him what you see now. It was murder, the assassination of a soul, but they called it an accident, and I believed them. Dreamer that I was, I dedicated my life to making certain no such accident should occur again, to making Stalton a safe place for its children, for their lives, and a beautiful place for their play. Stalton thanked me with his lips, but always behind their eyes, Behind the eyes of Gast and Yarrow and the others I knew, I could see the taunting mockery, the reminder of my brother, an animal imprisoned within the asylum's grey walls. He was the only human I ever loved. I was lonely and they'd made me so. I grieved and I knew it was because of what they'd done that I grieved. But I forgave them because I thought they knew not what they'd done. I forgave them till, once more, because of greed... They were determined to enrich themselves at the price of the soul of that which I loved, of this town I created, my all. If I allowed that road to be put through, it would have taken the town from me. I knew then what I had to do. They should not kill Stolten. I would, and swiftly. Stolten's soul was his children. His children should die. Stolten had taken the soul of my brother. I would take the limbs and lives of its children. Jock grunted, his shaggy muscled arm thrust out, jabbing a thumb at Hilda. She stirred then, and her eyes opened. Hell! she exclaimed, joy flaring into her tear-streaked countenance. Hell! You've come for... And then all the joy was gone. Terror and anguish were replacing it. But you're tied up too. He's got you. I've got him. 
Wayne broke in. As I planned. I've got him to punish him for interfering with me in the way that will hurt him the most. And Jock will take the blame for that as he would have done for all else if he'd been caught. Jock, go ahead. The madman whimpered like a grateful dog and sprang forward. The whip in his hand lifted. The metal lash whistled up, whistled down, and struck Hilda's flesh. A fiery circle sprang out upon it, a bleeding cincture belting her palpitating breast, and she screamed. Hal screamed too, screamed mad blasphemy as that biting whip flashed up, flashed down again onto the naked flesh of the girl he loved screamed wild oaths at the madman, at the white-haired man who stood, impassive, eyes glittering, and lips tight and white. Hal yelled his protests, but he didn't dare move, did not dare to stir so much as a finger, lest he rock the beam upon which he lay and bring it thundering down to strangle the life out of her. Smack! Smack! The madman was laughing now, was laughing and capering as he had laughed and capered before. He was dancing about his victim, her flesh netted with wheels now, with spurting wounds, her round soft body clothed with scarlet from them, and he laughed. And Hilda moaned. Kill me, Hal. Kill me. I want to die. And there it was. That was a way he could save her from this agony. Death. The only gift for her lover to give her. His muscles knotted ready for the leap. And still he waited while that whistling lash cut, and cut again, winding itself about an olive, quithering thigh, slashing across a taut abdomen, while a beast man capered. And then Hal Curtin leaped, tearing loose from the cords that lashed him. The beam leaped with him and crashed down, onto the head, the shoulders of the madman, crushing Jock's skull and pulping his adult brain. It was held for a moment, as Hal had planned it, by the great shaggy form that had danced beneath its slant. Held there long enough for Hal to tear free the noose from his sweetheart's neck. And then it crashed, with the bulk of the creature it had slain, to the ground. But Curtin had whirled and had thrown himself, ravening and mad himself in that moment, at the white-haired Wayne. Curtin's fist, Sledgehammers of vengeance catapulted, smash, smash, into the hollow cheeked countenance of the madman's brother. Smash. There was a crack of snap bone. Those furious blows had broken John Wayne's jaw, had broken John Wayne's spine. Long after, the older curtain would wake from a dream of never to be forgotten terror, and how would wake with her. She would turn to him, and he would take her in his arms and hold her close to him, knowing as lovers always know why she was trembling so. And after a while the trembling would cease, and Hilda would whisper, Hold me, Hal. Hold me close. Close, so I'll know you're here. So I'll know that always, always, you'll protect me against... Satan and all his imps, Hal would whisper. Forever, my dear. And he would hold her close. So there you go, my dear friends. Another one of the old school classics there. I haven't done uh, many of those recently. But um, I get back to it because I, I really do enjoy it. The writing is of exceptionally high quality. Uh, some of the words they use are a bit old-fashioned, I know, but uh, the writing's there, and that, you know, that's what makes the story, really. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing some more of those in the coming months. Now, um, still not feeling 100%, to be honest with you. Thank you for all your kind words of support here on X, Twitter, whatever, and elsewhere. Anyone who's got in touch, I'd really do appreciate it, and sorry if um, I haven't given you much of a response. Yeah, my energy levels are just completely gone at the moment. Which is kind of a shame because this week in the Netherlands it's Carnival. It's like a big uh, mid-February celebration where everybody just goes out and parties for several days, uh, drinks way too much beer, 
as a lot of fun and yeah, chaos ensues. But um, yeah, I'll see how much of that I'll be doing. Not quite that much, I don't think. Which is a kind of, as I said, a bit of a shame, but hey, what can you do? Uh, getting better is my priority. So thanks again for all your support and for continuing listening in 2024. Till the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.